Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a few months now since the successful conclusion of COP28, and now it's time to deliver on those key initiatives that were announced during the conference. One of them clearly being Altera, the Climate Investment Fund that is looking at fulfilling the objectives of COP28 about making climate finance available, affordable, and accessible. Let me jump into the panel discussion and we'll leave some time at the end in case you have some questions. <coughs> Let me start with your uh, Ambassador Majid, please. What's next for Altera? Well, Mercedes, first of all, thank you very much for hosting us and uh, <laughs> thank you to the panel for being here with us. Um, COP28 was really a, a seminal moment in the climate discussion, the climate process. And what was really great about COP28 was that we were able to take a really holistic look at the challenges we were facing in climate. And we know that the big piece of that was the finance piece. And we, when we traveled around the world, we time and time again heard from countries that finance was the problem. And as you said, it was neither accessible, available, or affordable. Yeah. And so we tried to challenge that at COP28. And I think that we did a great job. We had huge pledges on across the board on many of our action agenda and other aspects as well. And a big part of that was the announcement of Altera, this 30 billion fund. Um, we also have the climate finance framework, which provides a first time, a real framework around which we could start to have a discussion on finance. Um, and then of course, many other pieces as well. Um, and I'm excited here in the UAE, your leadership for the GCFC and the, the hub that we're trying to create at ADGM, that we're, for the first time we're going to have a place globally that is focusing energy around uh, climate finance and investing in green. The Altera Fund is a fund that is about scale, scope, and structure. So we have a 30 billion fund that's aimed at raising more than 250 billion. Um, it's got scope in that we are a global, but we are focused on the global south trying to see how we can deploy capital. And we started out with these three partners of Brookfield, BlackRock, and TPG. And they, with them, we've developed some funds that will be channeling finance to the uh, Global South in particular. But we can invest globally, which makes this a very exciting opportunity. And then we have this very unique structure where we have two funds, one of five billion that can take on more risk has the ability to be more flexible in terms of where and how it invests. And it it's allows us to really drive capital into the global south. And then this 25 billion uh, fund that gives us the scale and the ability to, to work with partners uh, to make sure that we're flipping what has been traditionally an 80-20. 80 percent of investment today is going to the global north and only 20% to the global south, where frankly the majority of emissions are, are going to yeah. be in the future. We need to flip that around so that we're investing in the global south and allowing them to leapfrog that carbon intensive development stage to a cleaner, more uh, <coughs> low carbon uh, future. Indeed. Um, and perhaps on the note of COP28, um, Clearly, Altera was one of the key deliverables. Uh, we also had the establishment of GCFC, the new center of excellency that aims at providing knowledge, partnership, capacity building. And also going back to a point that I would like to ask Dr. Mahmoud, pipeline, pipeline of projects. Um, how, how do you see Altera helping um, remove certain barriers, particularly when we talk about pipelines? Right. Um, thank you so much, and uh, it's great to be um, among this uh, distinguished uh, uh, speakers, and uh, happy to see uh, many good friends and many uh, uh, distinguished uh, participants in this uh, discussion. Um, I think Ambassador uh, Majid answered many of, of the issues when it comes to um, expectations and how to close the gaps. And we can spend time forever talking about global gaps and uh, COP27, COP28 had commissioned the study that are telling, telling us that the gaps are in the trillions, uh, 2.4 trillion to be exact for developing economies and emerging markets. How to bridge that? Private sector need 
to be doing much better in size and quality, at least four times of what we have of external finance from private sector. MDBs need to be um, uh, tripled in capacity, and bilateral finance need to be doubled. Now, we had heard of many promises before that the money is there, but there is no bankable or investable projects. I was very happy, especially in anticipation of what Altera can really be providing, that worked hard for almost two years with BCG, with the United Nations Regional, Regional Economic Commissions, with the, the teams from GFANS, from the climate champions. And I'm happy to tell you that if you can Google now or browse by any uh, search mechanism, you'll be seeing two reports. One is called the Compendium, and the other one is called From Assets to Flows. That, um, and on that, we have 400 bankable, not just bankable, bankable and investable projects. Mm -hmm. Many of them are in good stages of development small, big, um, um, large enterprises in various areas of work when it comes to climate action with SDG impact at the same time. And I think what was managed in COP28 is this kind of false dichotomy that climate action is not development finance action had been resolved by demonstration or by evidence and but by uh, what Ambassador Majid now mentioned about the possibility of this, not just the the end result and the impact, but even the process by having the catalyst um, approach, the capacity development approach, we can really solve that. So um, the pipeline of bankable investable projects, 70 to 80% of them are in the mitigation front, 20% are in the adaptation front. I'm happy given the emphasis on biodiversity and nature, especially at COP28, that many of the projects that we're tra trying to target are in this area, in nature-based solutions and biodiversity. They may need more work and more patience, perhaps, from the senior managers mm -hmm. of Altera, because as we know, the private sector didn't really find the many opportunities to establish its magic, not just in funding, but for risk-taking and realizing the benefits of working more on adaptation opportunities. So far, we have three to five percent of total finance, which is very small still, on adaptation coming from the private sector. Hopefully, with the leveraging, with the courage, with the risk-taking um, approaches and good partnership, that will be seeing some sort of game uh, changer coming from Altera through its convening power. This is beyond the money, the association of Altera with its uh, partnership, with the ability to use more and more um, uh, stakeholders and its convening power that can make a better impact not just on the traditional areas of renewable energy, solar, wind, or green hydrogen now as a good uh, potential, but more, I would say, in uh, nature and biodiversity. We talk about Altera's convening power and the importance we've been hearing yesterday, today, the importance of collaboration, private, public, MTVs. Samir, going back to COP28 and how, how does Altera fit into the whole COP28 finance strategy? We've seen quite a lot of announcements from a regulatory point of view, carbon markets, we've seen um, initiatives around de-risking uh, uh, projects, uh, initiatives, instruments. How does it all fit together with Altera and COP28? Yeah, very good point. So when we got into COP28, it was, and when you look at the finance kind of agenda that has been in COP, it has squarely focused on more or less transfer of public finance from richer to poorer countries. And it's a complicated agenda, but no, hasn't delivered to full satisfaction, but okay, that's the focus. So, and then you realize there are many parallel conversations which are taking place outside of COP process on voluntary carbon markets, on green banking, uh, private sector, and so forth, so forth. So there has never been sort of an umbrella view on how does it all play together to deliver uh, the scale of the funding needed and close the gap. So we, what we did, we issued the declaration on finance, which was signed by 13 countries. And 
it's the number of countries was not a lot, but it was a very inclusive set of countries <laughs> like India, US. Uh, yeah, we, we had our advisor said it covers 40% of the world GDP, which was okay. That's good enough. <laughs> if we got 40%. So and I, I think most of the population actually of the world because in India joined, that's why. So anyway, it was a, was very inclusive process. So we issued this declaration, which established what's called global climate finance framework, and it has 10 principles. It provides the sort of a logical construct and common view on how all these parts of financial architecture can move in the same direction to close the finance gap. So I don't want to go into details of these 10 principles, but uh, the, the, the very important outcome of that was just to have such a broad view and cohesive view going forward among all participants. That's one. Number two, which we actually now also validate in this uh, government summit by meeting all the people who are part of that process from international organizations and others, that we also uh, contributed to shifting the narrative on climate finance towards presenting this whole thing as an opportunity to invest and give some narrative to private sector to be actually in this game because uh, focusing just on the risks of climate change, which obviously are there and we'll see, and you know, we all this year, October was the hottest month which is very sad, but that doesn't you know, make the private sector go and find investment to do just because October was the hottest month. So <laughs> we, uh, I, I think we're creating, we created uh, a very good narrative. Now the, uh, you know, we have green industrialization program coming out of it for Africa and so forth. So anyway, to summarize the second, I think uh, sort of policy impact of this was that narrative, which uh, is, is, is makes, uh, you know, makes private investors to look into this closer. And then the third thing was basically creation of what UAE put as down payment to such new finance framework in a way, if you think that way. So Altera is one of them. There were other things. We'll hear about the DGM Center. We have the banks of UAE committing to green bonds in 1 trillion dirhams, so we're at $170 billion by 2030. There was the Africa Initiative. So I think all the stakeholders came together in UAE to actually put uh, you know, it's like a down payment towards this new system. This is how, at least on the private sector side, uh, all, all players can uh, scale the, uh, the <coughs> financing needed. I hope it didn't confuse anyone. No, no, very, <laughs> very the... clear. Maybe let me just move to Rajiv now. So we keep talking, we cover many, many issues. Perhaps, Rajiv, on blended finance mechanisms, such as Altera, um, but there are others, such as the US, India, Green Fund. How are they going to, how are they going to help the pipeline of bankable projects, going back to what Dr. Mahmoud mentioned? What's your view on that? Well, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Excellency and, and Ambassador and other panelists for having me here. So just to give you a perspective, and I think some of the numbers have already been uh, mentioned by His Excellency uh, Mahmoud. Uh, so, Ex-China, uh, by 2030, we need $2.4 trillion. Uh, and this is at least five times than what we are spending now. Uh, and uh, so private sector needs to pitch in, and we need to create an environment for private sector to pitch in. And that environment can only happen when we have, uh, you know, resolutions with regard to some of the vulnerable countries where you have uh, low capacity and, and unknown uh, kind of environment. Uh, they are, they, we need to introduce uh, market-based risk mitigation tools in those countries, as well as uh, we need to have what you call as, uh, how do we uh, minimize the risk of, of uh, you know, new and emerging technologies, and how do we measure impact? Because that's another big issue with most of the countries. So I think blended finance plays a very important role. Uh, uh, which basically provides a de-risking support uh, and catalyzing capital, and and where we we could actually make, ensure that the each participant of that pool or a blind pool is provided with the risk-based or market risk-adjusted based returns, uh -huh. and that's how uh, you know we would foster uh, innovation. Uh, we would. Uh, you know, create entrepreneurship in those countries as well as we'll create jobs. And so based on that, uh, and we are right now kind of emulating uh, Altera, 
and and because this concept uh, we have kind of followed Altera's model. Altera is a very large scale uh, kind of platform, but US IGF was also kind of emulated last year uh, immediately after the Altera announcement where both the government of India and government of US have provided a ca you know, what you call as a catalytical capital of $500 million each. And then we are saying that we will create a, a financing vehicle to support uh, the projects uh, specifically on the green transition projects in India. I'll just put some numbers right now. India has announced that by 2030, 50% of its uh, energy will come from uh, non-fossil fuel. Uh, so the capacity should be around 475 gigawatts. We are right now about 190. So if we have to reach that target, we should be putting up about 40 gigawatts a year. We do about 50. So there's a humongous amount of requirement. And based on this, the, the economical, uh, I would say, forecasting, for next 20 years, the demand will always supersede supply. So there is a huge uh, market. This market is existing, uh, and, and overall the business model with regard to the energy transition is doing quite well. Many private players have made very good returns up 20% on their equity. Mm -hmm. So USIGF very shortly, uh, I want to just you that this is a concept where we would ensure that there is a catalyzation of capital to the extent of, at the investment level, to the extent of about 30 times and at the fund level to the extent of six times. So a $3 billion fund could give you a, a catalyzation to the extent of about uh, four to six times at the fund level and at the, at the investment level at least 30 times, which means a $3 billion fund could actually give a catalyzation of about $90 billion of projects in the country. Uh, and, and, and this is a, kind of a unique platform where we are not getting into uh, the standard vanilla type products, which is uh, senior debt. So we are basically playing a game between the equity and the senior debt. India has a phenomenal market on the senior credit side. The markets are very robust, very transparent. Interest rates are, are very well defined through market process. I think the problem, with, uh, the challenge with India is lack of equity. And this is where we want to play. But not full equity game, but mm -hmm. a blended finance will play, uh, play in the hybrid or structured equity uh, so that we are able to turn around that equity at least three to four times in the lifetime of the fund and, and then create that kind of returns so we're expecting that the commercial guys will get returns upward of north of mid-teens um, uh, and, and the, uh, the, 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 the organization which are providing us the catalytic capital at least very high single digit returns, which is pretty much uh, be, uh, meets the requirements uh, so that uh, you know, we are able to ensure that all our, all our LPs ha have what they get. Uh, so this is what we wanted to tell you about the blended finance. Great. And I think this is something which we are right now following Altera's model, but at kind of a smaller scale. So from India to Abu Dhabi or the UAE, um, ADGM has been doing quite a lot of work around sustainable finance for the last six years, building an entire ecosystem. Uh, ADGM will also be the home for Altera. Arvin, can you tell us a bit more about ADGM's plan uh, to become a climate finance hub? Yeah, first of all, thank you very much you know, for having me on this esteemed panel. Um, <clears throat> I just want to take everyone back a few years now. Um, sustainability as a concept is not new to Abu Dhabi, right? I mean, you know, I still remember the first sustainable week that we did at Abu Dhabi was over a decade ago, yeah. right? So it's something that's very core to what Abu Dhabi wants to do. Uh, we also have one of the largest renewable investors today probably in the world, uh, in Mustar. So, you know, we've got deep roots when it comes to that. So logically, as the financial center of Abu Dhabi, uh, you know, we was looked at as that gateway and catalyst for climate finance initiatives uh, in Abu Dhabi, and we took that very seriously. So we identified climate finance as a core focus cluster for us, uh, you know, as Mercedes rightly said, six, seven years ago now. Uh, and we've done a tremendous amount of work over those years 
you know, one of our crowning glory moments, of course, is Altera coming and setting up an ADGM, and we're really grateful for that. I'll get to that in a minute. So <clears throat> what do we do at ADGM, uh, you know, over these years? We looked at it through three key pillars. Uh, the first, of course, and foremost, is the regulatory pillar. Uh, you know, I heard the panelists talking about creating an environment. And for us, the regulatory environment is probably one of the most important environments one needs to create. So there's been a lot of focus that's gone into creating that regulatory environment that's fit for purpose. The second thing for us was building the ecosystem, right? So you can have the best regulatory environment, but if you don't have an ecosystem where you have enough players around that environment, you know, there's a lot of work we've done in the ecosystem. Uh, you know, one of the more notable ones, of course, is the Abu Dhabi Sustainable Finance Declaration. Mm -hmm. Today we have over 150 entities, you know, and that creates a community that's very actively engaged on sustainable finance activities. The third thing for us then was community awareness, right? uh, making sure that people understand. And we, you know, we again we heard a lot about private sector. How do we get private sector more engaged in what we're trying to do? <clears throat> so there are two seminal events that we do uh, every year. Uh, one is of course the you know sustainable finance forum, which is part of the sustainability week which we've been doing for over six years now. Uh, and the second one, which has just completed its second edition last year, is RACE, which is part of our finance week, which is again focused on sustainability. So, there, so these are the three broad pillars uh, <clears throat> you know, that, that we worked on over the years. A lot of that then culminated in many ways uh, you know, in the crowning glory that was COP28, right? Uh, a lot of work went through over the years at COP28 and ADGM was very proud to be recognized as the principal climate finance sponsor at COP. Uh, you know, and we took that, on, that role on very, very seriously. And if anything, since then, uh, to define the legacy at what's done at COP, you know, we've doubled down in that space. Uh, the Global Climate Finance Center, uh, Mercedes, uh, where Mercedes is the CEO, is one of the most in important initiatives that we've launched, not just as ADGM, but I believe as Abu Dhabi and with the international partners that we brought on board as well, uh, to really be that thought leader in the space. Uh, I think we all agree that the Global South is where a lot of the projects in the future are going to be. Um, and you know, we believe as Abu Dhabi, we're well positioned geographically, you know, regulatory environment, you know, ability to conduct business, and I can keep going on. Um, and therefore we believe the Global Climate Finance Center will be that thought leader uh, in terms of driving that agenda going forward. <clears throat> the second thing that, uh, that we're you know, super proud of is, of course, Altera deciding to choose ADGM as its home. Uh, and I've always told Majid, we welcome them with open arms uh, and anything they would need. Uh, and we've had other players that have come in as well, you know, into that ecosystem today. I mean, uh, if you look at in terms of global financial players, AIIB you know, was a very notable entrant uh, that happened last year. Uh, and in terms of the funds, you know, we've, we've brought in the Black Rocks, the Ardians, the Invest Corps, uh, and a lot of the private capital that we were speaking about uh, that's come in as well. Um, so as ADGM, you know, we take this very, very seriously, and we believe, uh, you know, over the coming few years, uh, you know, we're going to see Abu Dhabi and the UAE becoming that center, you know, for climate finance, uh, and hopefully we can play a role in that. I think, yeah. Can I, is it okay for you? So Please. Please. So the... <laughs> Because uh, Rajiv also started speaking, uh, you, made, you said you don't want to do plain vanilla and you're creating, emulating Altera, which is very really great to hear that it's already, you know, <laughs> being replicated. But also that you're looking into between the private equity and uh, debt. And what I wanted to add is there is a reason why we put so much focus on, uh, from the beginning, on, on, on equity level intervention, which ended up being Altera as an instrument. because. This whole climate conversation is, has, has uh, been heavily uh, focused around the corporate debt, banking, IFIs, fine, that type of you know, uh, instruments. And when you look at, and the name of this today's panel is new economy, when you, when you think broadly, new economy, who's supposed to build this new economy? You, you need businesses to build a new economy, then you can, which you can then fund and <coughs> issue bonds and so forth. So we, we, that's the gap we went after like create the capacity to invest into whatever the new corporate champions of the new economy will be. Maybe it's synthetic fertilizer producers or uh, you know, the, the, the efficient agriculture, whatever. So that's why I wanted to mention that's what 
as COP28 we went after, and that's Altera. But then what ADGM coming in now with the center, and you, uh, the, our game theory is once you pull in others who are in this game of building new businesses in, in a closed jurisdiction like this here, we hope we achieve some sort of like a Silicon Valley effect, which we we'll always talk so about. So true. And if you if you think what venture capital did for um, you know tech revolution, it just they all got together, people thinking the same, exchange ideas, and there was a special type of money. Venture capital is an asset class. It led to uh, the unicorns and etc. I hope that way we end up providing you know creating that type of environment here for climate capital in a way. Uh, that would cause, I'm throwing a lot of big names there, but climate revolution in a way, right? So that, uh, just wanted to highlight that uh, we hope that's all these efforts, that's in, in few years, that's the, the, the total uh, impact of all this stuff together will be that. Please. If I may, yeah. just trying, coming from, from the field, how that is going to be uh, translated, I think uh, what Samir uh, mentioned about uh, climate finance being dominated by debt instruments is very much right. Globally, it's more than 65%. In the case of developing economies and emerging markets, it's more than 80% mm -hmm. debt reliant. So anything that we can really be doing in the blended finance more towards concessional elements and private equity participation, that would be better so for the countries and the companies dealing with Altera. And that kind of consideration yeah. is very much important. But we're dealing as well with an area that has a lot to do with the need for capacity development, not just out of charitable consideration, but basically because that will be reflected on the numbers at the end. If we know based on a recent study by the, um, the IMF economists that in the case of advanced economies, 15% of the losses are attributed to bad governance. In the case of emerging markets, middle-income countries, the case is 35%. Low-income countries is more than 50% uh, 50 of losses are due to bad governance. And here we're not talking corruption. We're talking about bad governance, yep. mismanagement, delays, uh, and here we're talking about... It's not the economics. No, no, exactly. So here the issues uh, that we're talking about, infrastructure, energy projects, so we need really to focus on this matter. But for that, down the road, hopefully before 2030, when we are reaching the 150 billion, what I may see, ready to see, the kind of the gold standard being built by um, Alter, that the, having the brand itself will encourage the country and the company and the projects that have the interest of Altera to promote themselves even better. As in my old days when I, um, uh, I have the sign that Intel is inside, I would say, well, this is a dependable kind of an approach and I can just work with this kind of machine. It's much more complex than that. Mm -hmm. So for that, I have just in a very fast bullet format because I have been giving it some thinking. Uh, so bear with me. So in dealing with the uh, bad governance, we can all spend time on regulations, and I, I hope that we'll be doing a better job than my former employer, the World Bank, by waiting forever <laughs> until you get matters fixed, and then you go the, uh, <laughs> do the, uh, the kind of injection of funds. Now, a better model that had been on, in operation, now being applied by the World Bank and other MDBs, like reform by doing, that you start like the investments in the solar plants in Morocco and Egypt. You start doing th something right, I incentivize you more by putting more money. You fix your tariff structure, you fix the competition, I'll do more money. So here you get some sort of encouragement while you're injecting the money, this is one. The second, the issue on speed. Now some um, organizations are saying that they are 19 months until they get a dollar out uh, from the door. Others say, no, we're much better, we're doing 14 months. I think with the agility and, and the kind of fast di dynamics and acceleration for Altera, that could really be proving that you still can take care of safeguards and governance issues and inject money fast, not in 19 months, but hopefully, I would say, 19 weeks. But that could be a, an exaggeration, perhaps. Leveraging the private sector has been mentioned in different ways, e equity more than debt. I would say as well, again, emphasis on biodiversity, better data, and knowledge sharing that, uh, yes, we are dealing with some confidential information, but as much as we can share what happened and what worked, that would be useful. 
blended finance is great, but blended knowledge as well will be equally great. And that there are many ways on, on doing this. We spoke about uh, the, these global gaps. They are going to be solved by local solutions. Because at the end, these projects are going to be in communities impacted, not just by the project, but how this project is going to be making some sort of transformation beyond the typical old uh, CSR. And is, is, is great that Mr. Jaffa here is trying to get the private sector as well closer to the work of philanthropy to have more meaningful kind of contribution. I have a new project in my um, uh, uh, town or my village. This means more opportunities and more scaling up skills. A regional dimension is important. I've seen the leadership of this country very much worried that it's not really, and that was a mistake of the past in some of the countries in this region. And we paid back heavily because of that, that some countries had been bragging, we are great countries, but in a lousy neighborhood. Now, for God's sake, neighborhood does matter, and we need to keep some sort of consideration in what we're doing. That neighborhood could be in a sub-region or the region at large. That could be bigger than the 30 billion in the ambition, but that should be considered. And then, um, well, I'm mindful to Her Excellency, the ambassador of the US is here, but if you are doing business in developing economies today, perhaps you are in between a rock and a hard place, between the CBAM of Europe and its conditions, and between the super incentives coming from uh, for the IRA. Great for Europe, great for the US, but here I think this is the message that in order to survive, otherwise, Altera's funds will be ending up in Connecticut, perhaps. That, and I have I mentioned that kind of a reference because I'm aware of two cases that were traveling in one advanced economy, another in an emerging market, they ended up in the state of Connecticut. Good for them, but bad for others. So the issue of, of competitiveness will be useful there, and that would require not just working in the green field, but perhaps dealing with the hard to abate sector, yep. the, to deal with the C-band, that could be a solution. Cement, fertilizers, steel, aluminum, gray hydrogen, and the ceramics have been added as well to the list. So these are opportunities for quick transformation mm -hmm. that I, I know that the, those who are organizing the work have a better list than mine, but I'm coming from these kind of immediate, urgent kind of requirements for funding as opportunities. And this all can answer your earlier question about do we have opportunities, do we yeah. have a pipeline? Yes, we have. It's an issue of choice and getting this kind of a mix between decent return and higher impact. Yeah, and how do we make opportunities? And I think the UAE has, with Alter and all the other initiatives, have also shown a leadership uh, when it comes to making climate <coughs> finance available, affordable, and accessible. We talk about regulation. Key to mention as well that the UAE ministries, financial regulators, and the UAE central bank are working on a transition taxonomy, governance, and disclosure requirements to deal with the data issue. We're seeing as well some developments around compliance and voluntary carbon markets. So all of this is happening together with the instruments, the ecosystem building, onshore and offshore, but also the importance of capacity building, partnerships, and uh, research around data and what constitutes the appropriate regulation and policies through the GCFC. Quick question, whoever wants to take it, with all of this UAE leadership approach when it comes to climate finance, what does it say about the country? How do you see the coming years? Perhaps your excellency ambassador. <laughs> um, well, thanks for the question. I think that what's exciting to me was that at COP28, we wanted to change the dynamic, mm -hmm. to go from uh, where we were talking about what we were taking away from people to what we're, talk what we're giving people. And I think that what you see in the conversation today is that the dynamic has changed. Whereas before COP28, we were all lamenting that there wasn't projects or there wasn't capital or there wasn't the, the right environments. Today, we're talking about how we're going to put those in place quicker and how we're going to make them better and how we're going to make them more efficient. And you heard that from Kristalina yesterday yes. in some of the conversations. She was saying, now we're talking about what we're doing, not what we should be doing. And I think that that's a really exciting moment for, for climate finance. I think that the, the UAE is really setting that leadership position. It's, it's putting itself out there and saying, here's what we can do. But let's be clear, we have a $2.4 trillion gap, right? That means that the UAE does its part, but we need other partners to step up and work with us to do that. And we need institutions like the World Bank, and you mentioned that in your comments, the World Bank and the IMF. These institutions were made 
for a post-World War reconstruction period, right? I don't think at that time they were questioning what the, qu the credit rating of Germany was for reconstruction or what the credit rating of France was for reconstruction. I think that they were thinking about how to reconstruct those countries. And I think that they weren't worried so much about the risks that they were taking to rebuild these countries which had been destroyed by a world war. I think that we need to bring back that mindset. We need to think about how we are helping countries to tackle climate change, this, this challenge of today that is equivalent, um, and take on those same risks that these institutions were designed for with the developing world. And frankly, based on the evidence from the experts, and there are many experts on this panel better than me, can set the evidence is, is that those risks are, are real risks. They are perceptions mm -hmm. of risk. As uh, Dr. Mohidi was saying about it's a good country, but it's a, in a bad neighborhood. What does that mean, right? Uh, we should be looking at economies, looking at, at these investments in of themselves and making the right choices because it's good for all of us. And the World Bank, the IMF, the, the multilateral development banks, they need to step up. We need donor countries to step up. Yep. We need more private equity. We need more private capital. Those rightly should be commercially oriented, but we also need um, the, 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 the donor countries and the institutions to step up and, and, and be taking those risks and taking those, uh, those steps forward. And then on the, on the other hand, we need the recipient countries to put in place the right policies and environments that protect those investments and ensure that, and that's good for them and it's good for everybody because then you'll see the real growth. Uh, and, and that's what you see today. Most of the, the, the conversation you saw from many of the leaders of the developing world is they want to create the economic momentum in their countries. They want to put in place the right policies, the right uh, investment environments. And I think that that means that this is a really exciting time for, for development uh, in, the, in the global south. Indeed, and the importance of collaboration. I think that's a great place to end our discussion. Um, and remains only to thank uh, the organizers, but of course our panelists for your leadership and knowledge. And we look forward to working with all of you um, to, to create that real climate finance hub to start moving the, the needle um, in the UAE regionally, but also globally. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you.